What we've seen over the past six or seven years now is an increasing awareness in the science press of the DNA links with these materials and how important they're becoming. They've talked about how they can be used to re-coordinate um, the uncontrolled division of body cells. This particular article here from Scientific American, the way it reads is, is this, that they place these, these elements at the end of the strands. The researchers examined the electrical properties of short lengths of double helix DNA in which there was a ruthenium atom at each end of one of the strands. Mead and Kayam, the scientists estimated from earlier studies that a short single strand of DNA ought to conduct up to a hundred electrons a second. Imagine their astonishment when they measured the flow along the ruthenium doped double helix to find that the current was up by a factor of more than 10,000 times. It was as if, they said, the double helix was behaving like a piece of molecular wire. Wow. It's our monatomic gold wires. They're able to turn the DNA into becoming a part of its structure, or vice versa. The two things can become one. By this means that they build up an integrated circuit of light within the body, and they have the ability to perform cell correction. In today's world, uh, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Austin in Texas has described these materials as exotic matter. It can think of no better way to explain them. They're exotic. They conform to no rules uh, and that they're not like anything else they've ever known. They are not on the periodic table of elements. Science has never known about them until the last few years. The Center for Advanced Study in, in Illinois um, classifies superconductivity, which is one of their main attributes, as the most remarkable property in the universe. So we've got something pretty amazing here. We've got a, a very ordinary looking white powder which is exotic beyond any comparison and contains abilities which are the most remarkable properties in the universe. And yet it appears like um, some grains maybe of talcum powder. So we sort of move towards rounding up here. Manipulation of space-time has been something they've been talking about for about the last five to seven years. A fellow here called Miguel Alquibuer. He's a Mexican mathematical scientist uh, involved with the Max Planck Institute in Germany, uh, was working at the time in 1994 um, uh, for the University of Wales over in Britain. This is the abstract at the beginning of a, uh, a multi-page document that he wrote. The journal Classical and Quantum Gravity, which caused quite a stir worldwide. He didn't pose any questions. He didn't say that this is what we're researching. He began his article with, we now know. In fact, the abstract reads, it is now known that it's possible to modify space-time in a way that allows a spaceship to travel at an arbitrarily large speed by a purely local expansion of the space-time behind the ship and an opposite contraction in front of it. A motion faster than the speed of light, reminiscent of the warp drive of science fiction. Well, we're back to the sort of questions that we have with the DNA and the strands. How do we solve our space travel problems? We know that, that people's lives can't last long enough to, to get to the distant stars. We know that our machinery and metals can't. We know that the fuel runs out. We know that these things are inordinate distances away. How do we deal with it? We deal with it laterally, as Alcabuire suggests. We think about it differently. We forget about the spacecraft. What do we do? We look at the spacecraft. We look at the million light years that it has to travel. And we know that that's impossible. So why don't we just take the million light years and put it behind the spacecraft? Why don't we think about that? Why not move the space-time instead of the craft so that with zero propulsion and no time having gone by, it can move through a million light years because you've simply screwed that up, tossed it behind it, opened it up again, and it says, it is now possible to modify space-time. Well, yes, it is. 
He was absolutely correct. It is now possible. This was followed in a series of related articles, American Scientist, an um, article written by the physicist Michael Spear. Um, he showed that this had nothing to do with violating Einstein's theory, the theory that nothing can travel faster than light. It didn't violate that at all because nothing would be traveling anywhere. It'd be staying still. Space-time would be moving. The acceleration rate, he said, would be enormous in theory, but there wouldn't actually be any. The true acceleration would be zero. Fuel consumption, zero. Time taken, zero. Distance traveled, million light years, maybe. So the question was raised, okay, it's possible, how is it possible? What's the device that makes it possible? And the answer came back loud and clear, exotic matter will be needed to generate distortions of space-time. The next question that went back was, what is exotic matter? Exotic matter, here's the description, it has the curious property of having a negative energy density, unlike normal matter that we're familiar with that makes up the people and the planets and the stars, which has positive energy density. The necessary exotic device is an operative superconductor. And in fact, the list of what exotic matter is, is the same list of every attribute that applied from the research tests on monatomic superconductive elements. They're the only substance ever to have been classified as exotic matter. What's needed to generate distortions in space-time? Exotic matter. What does bending space-time mean? It means the ability to move from one dimension into another, what did this stuff prove that it can do? Move from one dimension into another. And be brought back again. Nothing travels faster than light, they say, but we need to travel faster than light in order to make any headway. If travelling faster than light is impossible, the only alternative is to approach the problem from a different perspective. We must learn how to manipulate and distort space-time. The Ohio Aerospace Institute says that all of this is possible now because it's been recognised that, that space it's just like any other matter. It has a form, it has a shape, it can be bent, it can be distorted. And how did they recognize that? Because when the white light <laughs> explosions occurred, and 44% suddenly disappeared, it was a blaze of light, but light has no weight. So what was happening here? Light has no weight, it simply illuminates space-time. Oh, maybe it's the space-time that weighs 44%. Yes, it was. Space-time has weight. So, what the ancients saying about the Shamana and the Mufkut? It was all the same thing. Every description of these substances was always the same. We think about the Bible story, we think about the how we can make monatomic elements now, we need electronic devices, we need fire, we need all sorts of things, but we need electricity. In one way or another, we need electricity, and this is the one bit of the equation that has to be got through very quickly, because this is our last remnant, we think, about electricity. How are we going to produce electricity to manufacture our fuel cells if we don't have the fossil fuels to have our power stations? We get electricity from its most natural source, which is around us all the time. What we need is a device that will attract electricity, that will store electricity, that will discharge electricity in a very controllable form, in enormous quantities. However, we need to do it. That's all the Ark of the Covenant ever did and all it ever was. If you look at the construction of the Ark of the Covenant, it is no more than a model for every capacitor made today, whether it's a capacitor for lighting up street lighting or whatever. An insulated, double-plated box with a positive and electric, uh, a negative node at the top. That's it. That's all it is. And you look at the description of the Ark of the Covenant in the Bible, which is given twice. You take every measurement, you manufacture it with the materials that it says in accordance with everything it tells you, and you have a 100,000 volt immediate electronic capacitor. <laughs> The experiment did seem to be a success. The Ark did charge up like a capacitor, and the cherubim did spark between their wings before bursting into flames. Even in a warehouse in Vancouver, it's easy to see how people saw this as God in a box 3,000 years ago. 
You do what the Bible says and you place an oma of the shamana in it, golden part of the white powder, you place it in there, you've immediately got a superconductor. You've immediately got a device that sets up its own Meisner field, which will levitate, which will be able to travel on its own, which will be able to issue gamma rays or, or whatever you need it to do. A very, very powerful device. We have to go back to these very simple devices that simply pull it in and hold it and issue it. The Ark of the Covenant is not wrongly named. It's spelt with a K in the Bible because that was the Greek way of spelling it. In every other language it's spelt with a C and electronic arcing actually comes from that very same word.